I'm pretty sure it's just the three of us. If if uh, anybody else uh, joins this morning, um, we were planning on just finishing up, kind of like layout uh, content, the <clears throat> chapter six, um, HTML, CSS, and theming. All right. Okay. So what I was attempting to do this morning, and I was I was mentioning, I'm trying to compile this one particular script, and it is erroring out on a particular color, but I don't know what that error is intending to tell me. Um, let me go ahead and share screens and we'll get started. Okay. All right. I said I didn't want to troubleshoot R on the book club. That's usually not a, a good time to uh, uh, be trying to figure things out. Sure. Yeah. That's why I'm always impressed by live coders who like stream yep. Twitch. I feel like I couldn't debug things no. while I'm watching. No, I uh, uh, Twitch scares me. I I don't think I have the skill set to to do any Twitch. Uh, yeah. Have you ever, uh, in the experience that you have uh, viewed users doing that, have you ever watched Tan's Twitch page? I haven't. Um, you haven't. Okay. Uh, Tan does a lot of um, sports analytics, and he's very big about shiny apps. And this is a good uh, a good plug in for his his Twitch page, but. Um, I've connected and watched him a couple of times. Um, I do not take an active role in Twitch. You always see the message thread on the side where people are, you know, commenting back and forth as the as the user is is going through that. I've never been an active participant. I've always just uh, admired the uh, person that can do that. You're right. Um, but however, I don't think I would put myself in that position. Um, I don't have that much of of uh, oh, what's the word? This particular R Studio environment is not a uh, a point that I would feel confident in in doing what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. If there would be other subjects, yes, I'd be more than happy to to carry on a uh, Twitch uh, session yeah. like that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let me share. Uh, so I'm sharing screens. Let's. I'm not going to worry about this uh, example. Um, I, I believe this is from past book clubs. I don't recall writing this that I can, I can remember. Um, but let's go ahead and, and go back to layouts real quick. So I'm gonna do this in an alternate way. And I had mentioned last week, and I, I do want to apologize to those viewers, to yourself. Um, my point of entering this chapter six is not to produce a static slide deck that attempts to show a dynamic environment. Um, last week when I was expressing a lot of the details of I guess web development, right? The the dev tools in your in your browser. Most staff members or most individuals that are approaching this subject of shiny uh, are coming from an R Studio data analytics, data science, statistical type type background, and it's a preconceived notion that well, it's just web development. I mean, how hard can it be, right? No, that's not the that's not the thought to have. The moment you branch into developing this shiny app and then starting to push the boundaries of your, your recognition of web development tools, the bottom drops out. Uh, the, the, the foundation that you thought you were building from drops out because the web development uh, ecosystem is massive. It's huge. There's so many different technologies, so many different libraries, et cetera, et cetera. And so the path in which you are accessing these services and then pulling them into your shiny app, there's a very uh, easy tendency to, uh, what's the word, uh, go down this, this path, go down this rabbit hole, and then realize, oh, wait, that's not the library or the service that I want to introduce. Um, or it takes you a lot of time of research to uh, acquire some, some um, direction on which path to follow which 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 uh, library or which uh, service you want to you want to apply but at the at the end of the day when we closed off last week um, Lucy had made a comment and said well we didn't really get to layouts we didn't get to to like page layouts and I I, I agreed with her that's that is true so what I wanted to do is just focus on this one image for just a brief moment and this is not trying to increase my page size here, okay. When you are doing web development, when you are 
taking your code from a R Studio and compiling it using Shiny, uh, the Shiny package to generate an HTML page to generate your CSS library, et cetera. All of this is done in the background. It's, it's, it's under the hood. However, you can introduce details of that web page into your Shiny script that will render and populate the page for you. And so this layout concept in web development, the layout is very standard. The objects on your browser screen is an easy way to comprehend the placement of where these objects will, will land on your page. So if you have you know, a multi-pane type uh, web page where you've got you know, column one and column two, in the older HTML language, HTML 1.0, older, older scripting, there was a, uh, what's the word? It's a, it's a trick, uh, but you could create this, this ephemeral page layout using tables. That's not approved anymore. You don't wanna go down that path. If you ever read any forums or any posts talking about introducing this, you know, wrapping everything in a table so that it puts things where it's supposed to, don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. That's not a place you wanna be because that's not approved with the newer HTML 5.0, uh, the, the uh, or it's not 5.0, it's uh, HTML5. It's the, the, the more uh, dynamic environment of your, of your uh, uh, technology today. This page layout, what you want to do is imagine that your entire browser is the fluid page. Okay, so that's just a, it's a container. It's a place that is going to hold all of these objects. The fluid page is technically your browser page. All right, and we can scale that back and forth. We can change the size of that and everything will adapt properly dynamically. You will always have this title panel. Okay, now that's going to be at the very top of your page. Usually it's a heading level one. Um, in the shiny world, when you call on tiny uh, title panel, it's automatically creating this, this object across the top of your header page. Okay. Um, don't get confused with the HTML tag title, though that's a different subject. That's going to show up in your browser tab. Different, different subjects here. The title panel on the, on the fluid page is going to be in your active service, in your active window. Uh, the HTML tag title is what shows up here in your browser tab. Okay, it's not going to be part of the page. It'll be part of the metadata that is is your web page. Then we have this sidebar layout, and you can increase these as needed. Right, these can be nested as far uh, down as you would like them to be. But what's going to happen next is I have my title across the top of my page. Now I've got this sidebar, which is going to be this this. Uh, area or region on the left-hand side of my screen. Well, what if I don't want it on the left? What if I want it on the right? Well, that's okay. You just explicitly tell the, the system, Shiny, I want that side panel on the right-hand side of my page instead. So by default, it's on the left. If we want to force it to the right, we just tell it to go to the right. Eh, you could put left on there too, and it's not, it, it, it'll, it'll generate it uh, without, uh, without error. Then this, these side panels and main panel, so your sidebar panel, and then the main panel is the viewing window. Uh, and so if I could use this layout that we're using for our, our uh, uh, Mastering Shiny book club, uh, uh, the actual book, Mastering Shiny, what I want to highlight, and again, there's no definitive lines here, so I'm going to do my best to uh, kind of guide my, my mouse where I'm wanting you to view. This area here would be your left uh, sidebar or sidebar panel, okay? There's another one on the right-hand side, and that just happens to be the table of contents. The middle would be your main panel. This is the focus point that you want your user to see. Okay, so if I were to go back and run a Shiny app, and I had this one open, this is a very, very simple application. But what we're seeing in this page, this is gonna be your title panel, right? That's the, the, the heading level one of your page. We also have a object as a text entry with some other text, what's your name? Say, I can put whatever I want here, so, okay. And it's not 
I'm not having any response here. There, there's nothing that the entry box is doing, but the point being the creation of that object from shiny code, our studio shiny uh, uh, script into this, this web app format, HTML format um, is allowing this compiling or the, 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 the generation from one language to another language. So let's go back and view this script real fast. Move this off to the side, move that down. Let's see if I can get some closer focus here so you can see. All we're doing, and, and this is extremely limited, but all we're doing is calling on the Shiny library. So that's gonna give us the ability of, of access to rendering from a R script into the Shiny application. We're creating the user interface, the UI. And Frederica last week made a comment about the UI and the server. Um, these names don't aren't really important, but they are when you rent. Uh, sorry, when you call on the Shiny app function, the the UI and the server. You just want to make sure you're passing these names appropriately. So we call on Fluid Page again. That's your web page. I'm creating a tags link to my style sheet, and this is uh, type text CSS. And my reference is called styles.css. Well, if I come over here to my right, go back to my files, we're looking at some level of CSS styles. Now this book club is fairly lengthy and I'm not gonna find that fast enough for you. Yep, so, <clears throat> Let me, let me start here first and I'll, I'll express what's going on. When you compile or complete a Shiny app, it will often generate this dub, dub, dub directory. This is a common practice in the web development world. In most web servers, okay, so think of this as a physical piece of hardware that you are adding an application to and then putting some form of, of web service applied to it, you will create a dub, dub, dub directory. And most often case it is in the var, uh, see var HTML, var, var dub, dub, dub. In the directory, it will be under the variable folder. So you'll have, from a Linux perspective, you'll have var and then underneath there will be dub, dub, dub the application or the user rights to that directory are used, uh, usually uh, read and execute, but you do not have write capability. And that's by default because you don't want somebody to access or, or start to uh, pwn your server. You only provide that read and execute ability. It's a special folder that I can put content in knowing that it will execute and render on a web page, but it will not, uh, nobody can, can come back to the server and change or modify. My point being, inside this dub dub dub, it can uh, scale in size. You can you can put things in different folders, different directories. Um, you may have some images. You may have your CSS code. You might have some JavaScript code. These are all common web practices to delineate these different styles or types of text uh, media. What you're manipulating is called the namespace. So where is that folder located on that server, and what can I, how can I point at it? So the the reference I'm making to this is we're pointing with this tags link. I'm telling Shiny, or I'm telling R Studio, I'm telling the uh, compiler, my CSS file is located in this directory. It happens to be in the root root dub, dub, dub directory. But if it were nested someplace else, I would just extend that namespace path to the location of that folder or location of that file. The next is a heading one tag. And this is not common in Shiny. Uh, it's appropriate. You can do this, uh, but you normally uh, don't have to. Um, we're explicitly calling out an H1 tag. So H1 is heading level one. And then in our Quotation marks, this is a heading. Class is my class. Okay, well, we didn't talk about class. What is class? Class is a reference to that CSS to render it in a certain form. So in your CSS 
line up. Let's just open that file real quick because I'm jumping around here. We have a service called my class and the attributes, the look and the feel that I want to convey in this cascading style sheet, I'm telling it I want the font color to be red. Well, that's shorthand because all we're doing is calling out a uh, field name color and then populating it with the attribute red or telling the system I want it to be red. Well, if I change this to blue, let's just do this on the fly. Uh, keep it lowercase, right? All I did was change that color attribute, save the, save the file. Now, if I go back and I stop the service, which it probably already should be stopped. Let's just try reloading and go back to our app, refresh the page. I didn't do what I wanted it to. Sorry, team. Uh, I need to open that back. There we go. Needed to stop the service and then reapply the service. Hmm. Whoa, why am I not changing? I'm in the right area. I am changing the color to blue. Black. Sorry, again, on the fly coding while we're in the book club expressing what's going on. Do either of you have any questions as I'm going through this or any input? Um, yeah, I guess I was just wondering, so for, you know, when you have the heading one, um, does it make sense, like, if you already know HTML to just put the raw HTML code, or is this just, you, you know, can. aesthetically preferred? Yeah, um, no, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, wrong with going down that path, or it's, I keep using that term, I'm sorry, forgive me, I, it's this, it's this uh, direction to follow. Um, no, there's nothing wrong with uh, hard coding HTML into your page, what you would be compromising by doing such would be uh, removing the ability of Shiny to be Shiny. Uh, you're removing the ability of the, the RStudio and the package uh, Shiny to access some of its intricate features that allow it to render by itself. So what I'm, what I'm breaking from by saying it's okay to do that there's nothing wrong that you can do that. What I would recommend instead, if you want to stay within the ecosystem of our studio and the scripting of R, you could access those um, functions and features of our studio to generate and say, I want it to be a heading level one, and this is the text I want to put there, so that when you run the app, Shiny already does the hard lifting for you. Did. Do you understand what I just did there? I'm saying that you're allowing Shiny to be Shiny instead of you um, uh, uh, doing surgery inside the, the script. Because the reason this is not a good practice to follow in this respect would be your document starts to become very Frankenstein uh, where you're plugging weird things into it and it will be hard to maintain in a future setting. If you stay within the shiny ecosystem and the functions that shiny provide you it's easier to maintain in a future setting it's all too often that you will introduce features uh, introduce your own hard-coded services and then things break into the future and then you're constantly in this workflow of of uh, manipulation to make it make it work the way it's intended yeah. it's a great comment yes there's nothing that says you can't do it it's not a good practice to do that. So okay, thanks. at least my recommendation. Uh, let's go ahead and jump, but oh, I'll, I'll finish this one. So this text input box, by calling on the function text input, I'm creating this space of cell entry that a user would be able to enter information. Now on the server's side, we have nothing to uh, uh, bring that in. We don't have a, a receive, uh, fun, uh, yeah, we don't have a receive for that particular named variable, uh, named object name. Uh, if we were in the server side, then our studio would be doing something with that. The server side would be doing something with that text input. So the relationship of the browser versus the server, those are, uh, you'll always see a common practice between the two. If you're going to have a text input box, I want to do something with that text input. I want to manage it in some format. Okay. 
let's get out of here. Highlighting this one line of text, last week as I was expressing these details, I couldn't remember the three, uh, three object function. It's input, output, and session. That's what I was missing. Sometimes when you will look at others' code, you will see that the session is missing and that's okay. Session is a, a ability to interact. It's, it's, the, it's the back and forth between the browser. If you see script that has session missing, it's okay. Um, you may introduce if you're modifying that code or adding features to that code, and then it'll error out on you or it won't interact the way you want it to. Just add the session in there. And then now it becomes more dynamic. The line, uh, the exchange between browser and server uh, starts to operate. So that's the that's the three uh, elements that I couldn't recall last week. Input output session. Okay. All right, let's close this real quick, and let's do a different example. And again, this is on the fly, so stick with me. This is the one. That's what we just had. This is one I was trying to get to work, but for whatever reason, and I'm not familiar with Stack R at this moment in time, but Stack R was erroring out of me. I couldn't get this script to run. So let's stop this real quick. Say run app. Yeah, it's indicating that I, I don't have BS theme installed. I believe that's what is going on in this example. And I'll, I'll show you in the, in the textbook where this is located, but we're creating an object theme and we're populating it with the function BS theme. This is giving access to the BS library. Uh, Bootstrap is what BS stands for, Bootstrap library. And we're explicitly in a R formatted semantic or syntax. We're saying the uh, foreground colors being black, the background colors being white, the primary colors being blue, and the secondary colors being gray. Brendan, to your benefit of earlier asking the question of hard coding HTML, and uh, my response was yes, you can do it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to say that that's a, a common practice. This more BS theme format would be the appropriate manner in which you could do this. Does that help? So by accessing the bootstrap library, and I'll go there real quick from the book. We're still not finishing our layouts topic. Uh, bootstrap library. Now, <clears throat> before I go down this path, just know that bootstrap is not necessarily dedicated to our studio. It's more dedicated to the web development environment as a whole. You just happen to be accessing it from an RStudio perspective. So if you were doing web development in a different language, a different format, you could still access Bootstrap. So do you understand the differences that I just mentioned here? Our focus of the book club is from a RStudio mastering shiny format. However, the libraries that we're accessing can be utilized in other services, Python, Ruby on Rails, any other web development framework, okay? So Bootstrap as a service is nothing more than allowing a modification of format, modification of fluid page, different objects, uh, different color codes. You can uh, change the way, the look and the feel of your web page using this, this application. Um, examples of Bootstrap pages, let's see if I can show a quick one. I don't know, I'm just grabbing anything in the world here. So everything that we're seeing on this page, it's not much, but this would be a bootstrap themed supported website. Let's try that. So where we're having our different dashboards, orders, products, customers, uh, changing these, I guess this isn't interactive. No. Just clicking around here, right? Yeah, I'm not not having a good feeling about the format of this page, um, but your your layout, the the objectives of this chapter, 
the purposes of why we're expressing how to modify these these bars or sections of your web page. Um, that's what Bootstrap allows you to do is access this larger library of features beyond just what Shiny provides you, just what the Shiny library provides you. Um, I had a really, really awesome time and I'm not gonna be able to render it uh, back to not even on the page anymore. Chapter six. Scroll to the bottom. There's a, this plot. In the last book club, this took me a little bit to render, but once I had it uh, up and running, it, it worked really well. Uh, my code is not working, so I'm not gonna try and fight it. But what you're doing with this particular theme, okay, is I'm calling to say, I don't want a white background on my web page. Okay, by default, you're gonna get your normal color codes uh, in, your, in your browser. I want the background to be black instead, and I want my font to be white so that I have a, a sharp contrast between the uh, web page itself and any text laid on the page. You see this often, um, I'm gonna highlight this Darth Vader. So there's a there's an app on Chrome called Dark Reader. Uh, it's a it's a plugin, and it, uh, I said Darth Vader because it looks like a little Darth Vader guy. The uh, the dark theme, all it does is modify your background colors so that when the uh, web page goes to a server, says give me your code, dark theme jumps in and says nope, I'm going to take all those colors and I'm going to invert them. So you get a a a contrasting form of web page. In the example that we're showing in this ob uh, this graphical object here, you're hard coding the system to say immediately give them a dark themed web page. Then, if they want to change it to more white page, that would be what these other plugins would do. This is not any relation to our studio or any relation to any of the topic in general. Um, from a web development standpoint, white is often straining on the eyes. So I find a lot of uh, services. If you notice, my background is always in a black form or some kind of a, a dark form. I do this by purpose because if you're staring at the screen all day long, it's straining on the eyes. So I always try to go for more of a dark themed uh, Dracula, uh, sunset, uh, uh, sunburst. There's these libraries that will automatically change your environment to be less straining. But that's all CSS. That's, I guess, my point of what I'm conveying here is that uh, by using these features, you're accessing the information that would be contained in your cascading style sheet to tell, or the theming to tell the web page uh, what you want it to be, and then explicitly saying, I want it to be a different color. So you're, you're, you're augmenting the defaults, but you're doing it in a programmatic way. So Brendan, your, your earlier comment of the, the hard coding piece, you're doing it in a, in a shiny programmatic way so that the application will render as, as asked. The theme BS libs, BS theme, and then uh, boots watch darkly theme. That's what produced that dark background. Uh, we have the title panel, a themed plot. Don't do that, sorry, team. Uh, title panel is a themed plot. Again, that's why that title shows up there. Yes, to your benefit, you could do an H1 tag, but I would recommend that we do the title panel instead. The plot output is the larger main panel at the bottom of what is holding or containing our plot. Um, on the server's side, we're introducing the thematic shiny and then the output plot. So the named variable plot is what is connected here. So we're creating an output object with named variable plot as a placeholder so that the HTML user interface has an object called plot output. So that, that box, I guess, that is placed on your screen then we're populating it with the information connecting from the server, giving it the geom 
uh, or ggplot. Do you, does any of you have questions or details? I know that I'm not, I'm not expressing my, my interests as well here uh, or expressing my, my knowledge to the rest of the team as clearly as I should. Well, there is no question for that. All right. Um, with that said, um, we're only about 20 minutes in. Is that right? Uh, 36. Sorry, I'm way off. We're 36 min minutes into uh, me joining this. So about a half an hour uh, of time of me uh, covering this topic for this week. I can't recall who we were planning on to have chapter seven. Brennan, was that you? Um, I think it was Frederica. When Frederica, I okay. We won't worry about it. Um, if if Frederica hasn't joined the, uh, let me go back to the Slack real quick. Open up our Google page to see who was our planned presenter. Um, it's perfectly okay to either hold off or I can just keep talking about this subject too. Um, I will spend an eight hour session talking about web development in general guiding any user in direction they need. Where's my Google page at? There it is. Yeah, you're right. Chapter seven is Frederica. Um, and that's okay. I don't want to take away from Frederica in respect to graphics uh, or to ggplot in general. Uh, Frederica is amazing to watch in her output of plotting, visual plotting. Uh, she does really well in the uh, Tidy Tuesdays. I don't know if anybody has ever tried or attempted to do this. Um, I'm taking you on a tour now just to take up some space, but uh, Tidy Tuesdays is a service of the R Studio, I'm sorry, R for DS learning community. Um, the Every week on Monday night, usually Tuesday morning, sometime in that midnight changeover, they will post a data set with a, a uh, quest of that information. So this week we're going to study, you know, oceanic temperatures, uh, or we're going to look at, you know, uh, I think there was one with uh, uh, college uh, grading systems or, or college graduations, et cetera. But the, the posted data set is just the information and here's what we're trying to achieve. So you as a developer practicing skill sets learned from the R for DS learning community and the R studio environment, uh, you render your own code, create a one page or, or plot of, of information and try to convey it. Uh, normally users will post their code so uh, they can gain critique um, in the community. Uh, we are very often open with each other um, in a respective way. So you're, it's intentionally that you're not going to try and knock somebody down. Um, you can give them constructive criticism without uh, um, calling out and, and being negative towards your comments. So that's a great idea. Uh, you know, have you tried this library and, 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 and gone about it this way instead? Or what was your idea of, of going down this path? The whole Tidy Tuesday uh, application or uh, service within our community is the ability for us to, um, I don't know, try in real world settings and then getting feedback from our peers on uh, the, uh, if it's good or bad, <laughs> if, if, if you did the right job or not. Uh, and it's an often an opportunity that you can, you can exercise your skill sets as well running into barriers of, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm gonna post a, a question to the community and see what the responses are. Uh, Tidy Tuesday is a, I, I smile about it. I have not taken an active participation in it yet. Um, primarily, um, there's often too many other details in my life that uh, uh, take precedence. So um, I haven't given this focus, but it's always a, a high wish list for me. My point of expressing this, Frederica is very active in the Tidy Tuesday environment, and she produces some really awesome uh, graphics um, from a statistical standpoint and also from the, the uh, rendering uh, or output side. 
Um, I don't know what what else do we want to discuss? I'll let's do this real quick. Last week I opened up a web page I was working on for a project in in Africa, Guinea, Africa, Camsar to be exact. This service that I'm going to show is not. I, I don't want to. I don't want to open up into proprietary or sensitive information. Um, I'm generating the project schedule here. What I wanted to indicate, though, is that I am using some of the theming process to generate this web page. Uh, as an example, each of these objects on the left hand side of my text, uh, these are emojis uh, or emojicons, I think is the package. I'm calling out particular code that I want to, to use to create this object or to render this object. So this entire system is extremely technical, but each one of these pages have a um, purpose. I'm also accessing a, an application called the um, TimeViz. Um, so what TimeViz does is allows the rendering of a timeline, uh, a, a calendar entry, but it's in a dynamic form. I'm zooming in and zooming out at the moment. Um, I did not mean to do that. Where did my page go? So TimeViz allows this particular object to be placed on the screen and then uh, has a mouse listener so that you can increase and decrease. Now, TimeViz as a package, our studio package, is accessing languages, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML to ingest my CSV file of date time entries and then exporting it in this interactive calendar. The second object I wanted to show you is down here at the bottom. These are static HTML pages. And what I'm doing is authoring in Markdown. Okay, so I, I, I express this Markdown document. I compile it using an HTML tools feature that renders from Markdown to HTML. Then I point at that page, that HTML container, and allows the generation or pr uh, production, the output of that web page here. So each one of these are different heading levels, um, the text contained, et cetera. So Brendan, again, I'm wanting to continue focusing on that statement you made about hard coding. What I'm doing is containing the use of different applications stored in a different area, but then using Shiny to access that media to render it on my Shiny page. This is on the Shiny IO link. So. All right. uh, and then the last one, I'm still working on this one, but I created a, a uh, radio button for more detail. And if you, if you select that, it pops open a, a window. And I can't recall what that term is called, but um, it grays out the background of your screen and gives front focus on this uh, warning message. I think there's a warning, a caution, a note, check mark. It's like five or six things I can do, but um, this is dynamic. So by selecting that button, you can see I get some activity. The, the page looks like it bounces and the check mark uh, uh, is done. All of that is based on access to these other libraries individuals have authored these services to do this. I'm accessing them and pulling them in for my purposes. So um, let's talk briefly about Shiny IO. That would be a good topic to convey what we're doing. So let's go to Shiny IO. Uh, has either one of you used Shiny IO in the past? Yeah, I have. You have, okay, good, good. Nope. Maybe if I call it correctly, Shiny Apps IO. 
our studio as a service open source community provides the ability to generate a web page um, at your discretion. You create a user account, you link that user account to your computer, your RStudio session, and what it provides is an active web server. Now, the free version of this only allows one active web page to be uh, generated at any time. I think you can have five, five apps uploaded, but only one can be viewed at, at any one point in time. The pricing point of this, so the free version, yeah, it's five applications that you can post to the server, to the Shiny IO server. Uh, and then you're granted 25 active hours, meaning that users interacting with your service, it does have a, a, a timer in the background. So they only allow that server to live for 25 hours in one given calendar month. That 25 hours for most users is enough to express what they're doing and even convey if you're in an academia, Brendan, you're in that college setting at the moment. So if you're doing a project, 25 hours is probably enough for you to give a really awesome presentation beyond those of your peers uh, using this type of service. The starter package is $9 a month. I have not increased, but what you'll see is that uh, it, allows you to store a lot more of your media. Um, the way I manage most of this is I'll have huge quantities of, of shiny apps that I've created and they'll just be dormant. Uh, they're not they're not loaded uh, to be accessible. Uh, and then I'll take one down, put another one back up to just stay within that free plan. Um, it's not that I do not want to pay our studio yet. Um, I haven't found the personal necessity to do this yet. So I haven't invested any of my own funds to do this. Um, what I was going with though on our studio, when you connect is this extra button um, and it, it allows you to publish your application. So this is similar to our GitHub, Git language push pull type concept. I'm done with my app. I can render it local to my machine. Everything looks and in, uh, as, as intended. Then I will post it to, I'll publish it, uh, push it to that web server. And then now that our studio managed application, I can access it from a different URL. Okay. Um, if you go into manage accounts, um, this one, I just happen to be called training manager, but um, when you are walking through the procedure of connecting your computer to Shiny, you have to generate a key. It's a particular um, encrypted form, again, similar to GitHub. You create your account and then you save that file to your local machine. When you publish, it's validating your credential, uh, allowing you access into that. And it is a very automated service. When I'm in the midst of, of <clears throat> actively working with another participant, um, I'll modify the web page. Uh, we're conversing over some topic. Um, hey, it would be really nice if I saw this. Okay, not a problem. Give me one second. Clackety clackety clack. Republish. Okay, refresh your browser. Magically, everything shows up. Um, that's the entire workflow in a, in a nutshell of being able to, to update on the fly and, and publish it to this application. Um, in a quest of I'm not circumventing the paid services, uh, in a method to test abilities without uh, paying any funds, um, I have my own web services, my own uh, hardware, physical hardware. Um, and I don't believe that I'm unique in that respect. Um, but what I do is have my own local our studio service. Okay, so this would be uh, the equivalent of the, uh, oh, what's the brand name that they call this? It's, it's the R studio server. Um, one of another cohort member, Lydia, uses it often. Uh, this is a R studio in the web. Um, you don't have to have it locally installed. Uh, don't do that. Just log in. Uh, what you'll be given access to though is, is a web server running our studio that you can run your script, change things, manipulate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you notice, this is not, it, it looks the same, it, it looks identical, but
but it is a different server altogether. Um, this web application, I was working through the engineering production grade Shiny apps, um, the mastering Shiny, I was doing some other details with, with analytics in general, and I wanted to exercise uh, the ability of doing this in a more sysadmin form uh, or uh, my own internal dev environment form. So creating this space, accessing this space, and then being able to render it, the only, only, only comment I will make towards this idea is the fact that if I run app, it's not going to do anything because it doesn't know where to go, right? I can't have a web server built on top of another web server. It, 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 it'll act like it wants to run, but it, it won't run. Yeah, I can do this local. So uh, actually this is a good example. So this is the theme plot um, waiting for it to populate. So this is great. And I can, I can view it in my, in my viewer of our studio. However, if I select this option to pop it out into a browser, it won't work. It won't go anywhere. Okay, never mind. I'm going to I'm going to stop now. It did work. It is rendering. So if you notice, I'm tight. Uh, sorry, I'm pointing at my base URL, which is the web server. Um, I'm accessing port 8787, which is by default, the our studio environments, uh, uh, port identification. This is my browser connecting to it. And then I'm accessing a particular uh, temporary rendering of this page. Uh, that's the rest of that URL. But this is that themed plot. And what is awesome about this, zooming in and zooming out, it will automatically change the form, the font size. Um, let's try to refresh. I don't know why it's grayed out. It was me zooming in and zooming out that did it. Um, what I was going to do is go into Dev Tools real quick. And from the Dev Tools side, what I want to make connection to is what I'm calling it in the server side. It's not even open anymore because it took over that tab. Forgive me. Just got to pull that back open again. Um, rendering the code and then witnessing that same output from the HTML rendered side. Uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of these div tags. So the, the themed plot, if you're ever troubleshooting or, or trying to figure out the connection between the named object in our studio versus the named object as it's rendered on the HTML side, uh, right click and then select inspect. And in the dev tools side, it will automatically highlight that line of text. If you see any errors, if you see any notes, uh, the thing that I always watch for on the dev tools is this um, uh, uh, notification. Um, if things start to break, you'll get a red box or a warning saying, you know, things are running too slow, or maybe you're using an out of date library and it could be a security vulnerability. Uh, the dev tools are monitoring a lot of those features and allow you to uh, uh, a reminder, uh, optimize. You might want to update some line of text or some entry, et cetera. The last thing, and this is just brief, uh, but I'm, I'm wanting to take up a little time here. We're almost at the end of our session. Uh, we got about 10 minutes, right? I think I, I joined it about uh, six till. So um, yeah, the uh, 10 minutes more. Lighthouse is a test of your page. It is a, uh, the word load comes to mind, but that's not the right term, load test. It is exercising your web server and your loading of the web page for optimal purposes. Lighthouse allows you to run a lot of these feature tests 
on your application and then gives you some responsive page back indicating uh, where code may be slow. Great, great, great examples in a shiny environment is rendering plots. If you notice that your web page hangs, all right, or it just doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't paint the the browser as expected. Often, what you're running into is some parallel operation. Uh, the container of user space is being generated on the page, but it's not populated with information. There may be uh, some slow process going on in the server's end, and it's not able to apply it. If you've got large data sets, if you're doing a lot of manipulation, et cetera, um, these are all costs that you want to monitor to make that user experience the intended, uh, intended format that you want it to be in. You can run this lighthouse feature, and it will give you uh, this test back and forth. So my browser, Chrome, as the dev environment, is running this load test on the web page on the server, generating uh, features of my code and then telling me uh, what is what my performance is. <clears throat> I guess I'm getting a bunch of errors. Um, if this were a different web server, it'd probably work better. Um, maybe if I just go to Google and try run, running Lighthouse on Google server, uh, I could give something of importance. But um, you get a lot of these reports back and it grades your your application. Um, let's try this on here. Just give that a shot. Yeah, see, I'm getting a bunch of errors. That's the note that I was mentioning. If you were to look at your console, pull that up. I'm getting a bunch of, of uh, JavaScript, HTML widget type errors. Um, that's things that I should probably go look at. It's probably why the site doesn't work the way it's intended. Uh, but if I run report, now I'm pointing back at Shiny IO and I'm asking them to uh, go through all of my web pages on that server and then give me back some information. Hopefully I'll have this in a second. Um, Brendan or Olu, have you? Have you used uh, dev tools in your browser in the past? I have not. Okay. And it's not, it's not intended that everyone goes this route. The first time I accidentally entered into dev tools, I thought, oh no, did I break my computer? Dev tools is a great, great environment to witness the, the intricacies of the document object model as a whole, all these various uh, ports and plugins, uh, calls back and forth of what it's doing. The dev tools as a utility for troubleshooting uh, web framework um, is very helpful. It's not the only, only uh, application that will do this. Um, but if you're in the midst of why is the, like, like you're triggered by, um, a feature of your application not working the way intended, you can always drop into dev tools and witness it from our studio's perspective, witness it from your web browser's perspective. What is breaking down? Somewhere things are not being rendered properly, or I'm running into a call back and forth between two parties. What feature, what uh, line of text, uh, what point in my script is this starting to break down? Um, getting into troubleshooting, getting into diagnostics helps uh, not only recognize what is happening from a computer's perspective, but then also you as the developer writing your script, you might find uh, more optimal or, or aesthetically pleasing ways of, of presenting details. I received this audit back, this test uh, report back from using Lighthouse. Uh, it looks like my, my uh, web page is horrendous. Um, it takes forever to load. So that might be an opportunity for me to tweak out some performance. Um, from an accessibility standpoint, I'm getting a grade of 84. Um, the language I'm using, the color theming that I'm using uh, makes it, when they use the word accessibility, it's talking of, of uh, uh, the human 
perspective of the web page. Um, did you use good themes? Uh, is the, the text hard to read, et cetera? Um, it appears I'm following most of the best practices, but that's just because I'm sticking within that world of shiny rendering to the HTML page. Uh, Brendan, again, I'm, I'm highlighting your earlier comment. If I were to make the page difficult to render by introducing all of these various tags, this best perform or best practices may get reduced uh, because I'm not I'm 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 introducing potential compromise with my with my uh, web page. Um, I don't remember what SEO stands for. Uh, ultimately, though, at the end, and I think you can print this if I'm not mistaken. Or, yeah, you can export it. Um, this grading system that they use is awesome to, uh, I don't know, gauge your, your current abilities. Uh, how can I make my page even better? And the engineering grade production shiny apps, the Colin, uh, Colin, Colin, what's Colin's last name? Uh, the book that he authored, the, the previous book club, we spent a lot of time talking about the proper methods of generating a packaged form of R shiny, uh, sorry, mastering shiny, um, being able to, to work with this performance level and tweak out uh, the, uh, the, the, the smallest elements to increase user interaction. So that's it. Does the team have any questions? Have I covered the topic in its entirety uh, for the uh, purposes of our book club? I think so. Um, I think I have a better understanding of the layout and themes. So yeah, thanks for this. I'm I'm always open and happy to uh, jump in with any of our team members. Um, Slack is a, an outstanding ability to interact with. Um, I'm not saying that's the only way that we can we can exchange. Uh, there are moderator panels uh, or pages um, help services within Slack and what you're doing is accessing any of us that are, are also in the midst. So you can pose, uh, you can post nearly any question and some user will, will either A, ask for more information um, or B, uh, understand and interpret your, your question and, and usually will give a very good response. Um, there's, uh, there's about 12 or 14 active uh, mentors at the moment that are on those help menus. Um, if you follow the R4DS learning community on Twitter, um, the help menu, uh, sorry, they'll always post help hours. Uh, we are a global community, so time zones are kind of irrelevant. Um, they will post on Twitter active hours of when the, the uh, mentor will be online. Um, it's asked that whoever is, is going to be facilitating or, or answering questions, at least give an hour of your, your time for that person to connect with you. I've connected with others on uh, both Teams, uh, our Zoom links. Um, if we wanna jump into some Google Hangouts or some other, I won't go Twitch, I'm sorry, I don't have a Twitch account. But um, if, if we wanna jump into another arena, I'm happy to share my own time with you as well in development. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. It's very, it's very easy to be in the moment and need like immediate response. And that's the only comment I'll make is sometimes our staff are, are sorry, the, the volunteers in our community, uh, you always have to take into account that uh, you're, you're accessing a volunteer service. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect an immediate response, uh, but it's always worthwhile uh, to, uh, ping somebody, hey, can I, can I get online with you real quick? I'm trying to do X, Y, and Z, and this is what I'm running into. Um, it's very, very good. And the community is very welcoming in that respect. So, um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, uh, as a smiling comment, um, Brennan, I won't be able to do your homework. I apologize. I, I, won't, I won't be able to, to, to uh, complete any assignments for you. I'm joking. I know you're in that college setting, so I wanted to throw that in there. Oh, the, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, my, my kids are what I'm thinking about. Uh, always asking, hey, dad, can you, can you help me out here? 
And what ends up happening is we're doing the project forum concept. I, uh, I'm always careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I have for the presentation. I hope that I was able to cover this week or at least extend the topic of this uh, uh, particular chapter. Um, this will be the second time I've, I've given this presentation. Uh, if I could give my own personal self critique, I don't think I did as well uh, this second time around than I did the first time. But um, even, even the first time I didn't, uh, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have any presentation media uh, for this. It was all very much on the fly, so. Right. No, I think you still did a good job. I mean, I haven't watched the first version, um, but I'm guessing it's um, on YouTube or on the- it is yeah it it's already been posted um the the thing i i i often and this is again this is my own personal critique the thing that i often uh run into errors with is i squirrel too fast um, i'll get off into this tangent of topic for 15 minutes um and the rest of the staff or the rest of the the individuals watching are like man i don't know i don't even know what this person's talking about so i'm always uh self-aware of that tendency I try to stay focused at least, or attempt to stay focused. Anyway, um, that's all I have, or, or that's all we're going to deal. Uh, I'll try to connect with Frederica on Slack and find out if, if she'll be available for next week, chapter seven, um, our graphics. Um, again, the, the, the graphics within Shiny is accessing oftentimes ggplot, but that's not the only one. Um, there's also a Plotly library, but that's not in this, this chapter. Um, graphics in general is its own book club. So um, although we have a topic within our Shiny environment, this, this particular book club, um, there is also a ggplot book club, and that will take you way further into graphic elements. If, if that is a, uh, a uh, curiosity that you have, um, I would recommend also reading that and or uh, checking out those uh, videos as well. So, all right. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And I'll see everyone next week. Outstanding. Right. Thank Bye. you, Brandon. Thank you, Olu. I appreciate it. You have a great, great day. You too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.